With me in the studio are Professor Bola Akintenrowa, Director General Bolitak Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies. Yemi Adamolekun, Executive Director, Enough is Enough. And Chiko Gea, former Commissioner for Information, Delta State. Well, it's now official. Ugiame Shola Emiko is the 21st Ulu of Wari. The 37-year-old will be addressed as Atuashe III, and is expected to unite the Ishakiri Kingdom for peace, growth, and development. Emiko was announced as king designate in April after the death of Ogiame Nkemwole, the 20th Ulu of Wari. Our Yoruba brothers have an expression. When the palace of the king burns down, it is because a more beautiful one wants to be erected in its place. The taboo that was done by the desecration of our most prized crown jewels made a way for a more beautiful one fashioned by our own royal person while staying true to the inspiration of the one that came from Portugal way back in the 17th century. Before then, however, Olu Ginoa I brought a coral beaded crown from the source in Benin. And that crown adorned the heads of the first six Olus. Olu Atuwashe I brought a pair of silver crowns that would adorn the heads of the next 14 Olus. By the special grace of God, we have the privilege to introduce a new pair of gold and silver crowns to the already rich and beautiful history of the attire of the Olu of Wari. And as the progression of our crown is symbolic for all to see, from coral, to silver, and now to gold. Well, also in Kano State, Governor Abdullahi Ganduje has formally presented the staff of office to the second Emir of Bichi, Alaji Nasio Ado Bayero. Bayero's coronation attracted traditional rulers, governors, business moguls, and many others. Arise News Managing Editor Christian Ogodo reports. Thousands of people of different colors and shades gathered at the Beachy Township Stadium to witness the historic coronation and presentation of the staff of forfeits to the second Emir of Beachy after two years of the creation of the Emirates. Amidst the fanfare and pageantry of the occasion, the ceremony underscores the personality of the new Emir. In his drive to serve the people of his Emirates, the new Emir pledges to pursue the socio-economic development of the town and enjoins the people to acquire education as a means to a better future for self and society. On his part, the Kano State Governor extolled the virtues of the Emir and assures people of government's commitment to development. I am optimistic that the British Emirates will experience extensive transformation under the stewardship of His Highness Al-Haji Nasiru Adobayaru. The good effort he is making towards promoting the well-being of his subject is acknowledged and our administration will do all what it takes to ensure that this good objective of the British people are being realized. It is a new dawn in the annals of Bichi Town with a formal ascension of Alaji Nasr Addo Bayero to the exalted throne of the Emirate. He is reputed to balance traditional exigencies with religion and is an astute boardroom player on several companies, including nine mobile communications, which he chairs and is expected to bring the much needed socioeconomic development to the town. Christian Ogodo. Arise News. Well, there we have it uh, in uh, the Wari Kingdom, also known as the Wari Kingdom. Uh, it looks like we have some form of closure. 
uh, with all the controversies that had uh, attended the emergence of then, as it then was known, uh, Prince Shola Emiko as the uh, Ulu designate. Yesterday, he ascended the throne of his uh, ancestors uh, to become the 21st Ulu of Wari. His own father, uh, Atuashi II, was the uh, 19th Ulu of Wari. But for me, what I found interesting there was that uh, you know, the new Ulu of Wari uh, went into history and he tried to settle the issue about the crown. The uh, silver crown was brought to the kingdom uh, in the 17th century by uh, Don Antonio Domingos, known as Omogene, and later Ulugene, you know, uh, the, the king with the uh, shining, shining light he was known as. Uh, but then we were told a few days to this uh, coronation, those two crowns have been uh, suddenly disappeared. But here you have this 21st of Ulu of Wari uh, introducing both silver and uh, golden crowns. Before then, before Domingos, uh, they used, uh, you know, uh, beaded crowns. So that matter has been settled. But I think that the major task before the new Ulu is to unite the kingdom, uh, to bring the people together to ensure reconciliation. But you are from that axis, uh, <laughs> Chiki Ogea. Your take may well be more important. Well, it, it, was a, it was a great day for every Delta, and I'm sure, and the Shakiri people in particular. Um, across the board, like you said, it was a cultural extravaganza, so to speak. And um, for once, as far as I'm concerned, something very, very positive was coming out of Nigeria across the length and breadth of the country showing a very rich heritage and culture, uh, which I think is something that um, we are all very, very proud about. But more importantly, if we focus more on what happened in Wari yesterday, I don't think I have felt this good in a long time. Being a Nigerian, this is not about just being Delton. To think that um, we have this kind of young people, because this king is 37 years old, um, that obviously is in the generation of our children. And um, I was beginning to almost lose hope, thinking that um, that generation was all about BB Nigeria and all of that. But this king has shown such resourcefulness, such intelligence, such depth, you know, and it is crowned with so much spirituality. Look at the way he started singing. I mean, even I myself, I was overtaken by the Holy Ghost, I can tell you. It was incredible. Um, that young man obviously has been primed for this. He obviously is living his destiny. I wonder why it had to, you know, we can't question God, but, you know, it went, you know, the route God said, and it eventually came. In fact, there are some dates that are showing that the whole thing is done God-ordained. He's the 21st um, Olu. It happened on the 21st of August. You know, and, you know, there's a lot of mystic, um, I don't know, to this thing. But as far as I'm concerned, I am very, very proud that a young man of that kind of depth is becoming the next Olu of Warrior. Okay, congratulations to Atua Shea the third. But uh, you know, yesterday when that ceremony was on and it started with that Christian song, somebody sent me a text that he hopes that uh, Iyeolu, uh, that's the mother of the king, will remind Atua Shea the third that uh, when his father took over, Atua Shea the second, he was talking about Christianity. He wanted to be a born again Christian, yes, and that uh, generated some controversy yes. because this is one of the oldest, you know, stools that you can sit on uh, in Nigeria. But Prof, let me come to you. I cannot agree more with uh, um, Shiki. The the beauty, the aesthetic look, the organizational skills demonstrated yesterday made me feel very proud as a uh, as a black man to the extent that I now said, look. Why not look at Olu of Wari, the Emir of Bichi? How could the two events be taken advantage of? When I sat down and I said, okay, instead of talking about Bichi and Wari, 
I coined one word out of the two, and I call it Bichari. Then the title itself, Emia and Olu, and I said we should have one word, Emiarolu, meaning now that we should be talking about Emiarolu of Bichari. Why? Because in the foreseeable future, if we do take advantage of um, 21st August, if we take a look at um, the Olu of Wari, at 37, I think we can take advantage of culture to grow our development in such a way that we should, we should stop politicizing culture. Whereas we should culturize politics. We can use culture, you know, to address many of our problems. If Nigeria can come out, can present the type of, um, you know, cultural events in a beach, with what I could see with my two eyes in a worry, look, God made Nigeria great, but Nigerians certainly militate, work against what God has done for us. So I, I, I listened to Olu of Wari, and he made three significant points that, look, I can never forget in my life. For instance, he said the people of uh, Iwiri Kingdom had been caused in the past, but he confidently used the spiritual power of God in him to say, no, he put an end to the cause. And that henceforth, you know, his kingdom is divinely blessed. The other point is that uh, he upgraded the status of his, uh, uh, of his wife and his mother and gave them new names. So when you look at this, look at the speech he delivered. In the extent Pori, no, I think the future of Nigeria can be greater than what it is if we begin to follow the type of leadership that we can expect from this Olu of Wari. Well, Congratulations. We wish, we wish the Olu of Wari at the third, the very best. But if we go uh, all the way to uh, Kano, to Bichi, I think it's double congratulations for the Emir of Bichi. Uh, this weekend, uh, his daughter Zara uh, married the daughter of the president, uh, the son of the president of Nigeria, uh, you know, uh, Yusuf Muhammad Buhari, uh, the wedding of Yusuf Muhammad Buhari and uh, Zara Adobayero. And uh, this was a very big event. And some analysts have said. With more than one million people. Well, <laughs> well, some people have said that President Buhari has used that wedding to make a statement. And that was also a royal event on its own. Uh, more dignitaries attended that event, yeah. according to one commentator, than you know we, we witnessed in the wedding of uh, Prince Harry uh, of uh, England. And then, of course, some people have also said, look, it looks like the Bayeros are creating a dynasty in Kano State. They're in charge uh, of uh, Kano, they're in charge of Bichi. But you know that the story goes all the way back to the Second Republic about the creation of those Emirates and the politics uh, that was played by the Kano state government with the former emir of Kano, uh, Lamido Sanusi uh, Lamido. But whatever anybody says, I think we should congratulate the uh, young couple and also congratulate the new emir of uh, Bichi and uh, President Buhari himself, who managed to use that wedding to unite so many uh, divided uh, bridges. That, what that, do you uh, think, Chike? That, that, I think, is the point. You know, um, what I was happy about was that I saw so many unusual bedfellows, you know, at that wedding. And um, you see, politics is not war like we seem to do in Nigeria, where everything has to be do or die. I wonder, you know, how we got to that. And um, as this administration begins to wind down, it is a great sign that I like that the president emerged that because I'm sure there were a few people I saw there that obviously don't, are not in his political camp, have criticized him all over, and uh, he could have left instructions to say, look, I don't want those people at my, my son's wedding. 
But the fact that, you know, it was opened up, and um, I can begin to see a healing, a revival of the country, where we can start focusing on the better things. We start focusing on the issues and leave personal things alone, leave personal abuses and all of that, because that is not what is going to take us to where we are going. So to that extent, of course, it was a colorful wedding. Of course, there are a lot of critics who said this president came in on the basis of being an austere person, you know, not given to frivolity, and there were 50 private jets, or was it 100 private jets parked there? And you know, some people are criticizing that. But for whatever is worth, the important thing is that the young man and the, has taken away his princess. And like you said, <laughs> the, 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 the carnival of you know, the new emir in Bichi, you know, which also showcased the northern culture, you know, the Islamic culture, that just put in the pot puree, you know, side by side with what we saw in Worry. And um, like I said, it's, there, there is no greater expo, expose for our strength in diversity than what we saw this weekend. Rolf, any further comment on Bichi? If for not, as long yes. as we do not politicize our, you know, the cultural diversity. I have said earlier on that it is better to culturize politics rather than the reverse. What he has just said, uh, I, I cannot dispute, no, nobody can fault that. You see, if uh, the beauty of it all is that the way Nigerian politicians think, the way Nigerian politicians act, the way Nigerian politicians say things, that is precisely what is creating a fundamental problem for Nigeria's unity. You know, if, for instance, uh, uh, those people who criticize uh, PMB, I mean uh, President Muhammad Buhari, they consider all these factors. But if you remove a political chicanery from the equation, please, there's, there's no problem with Nigeria. But if the president himself, the father, the father, all right, uh, you, you, are, you are giving your child, you are, you are having a good marriage, and everybody is coming. That would have been exactly the same mentality that the president would have had in his uh, political governance philosophy. If he does that, please, the problem will be simpler. But if he continues uh, gambling with um, uh, double standards, no. There's no way he will be able to make through. But congratulations to all of them. Well, I think we have Yemi Adamalekun with us right now. Well, Yemi, see, one of the big issues with regard to uh, the coronation of the Ulu of Wari was this reference to an edict in 1979. Uh, and was, that was quoted by those who opposed him on the grounds that if his mother was not from the Edo kingdom or from, of his security er, er, extraction, he could not be uh, the Ulu of Wari. But I think that that has been settled right now. Because, look, if you dig into history, Don Domingo's uh, son, uh, the, Don Domingo's was the eighth Olu of Wari. He was submitted, uh, so succeeded by his son, Omiluri. And he, oh, his son, Omiluri, had a Portuguese mother. His father, having graduated from Cumbria University in Portugal. But somewhere along the line, some people changed the rule. Is this a vindication uh, for women's rights and the rights of all women who are good enough to grace uh, the royal chambers in the land to have their children who are original products, uh, you know, to be, uh, uh, to be king also. I don't know the people who change the rule. <laughs> Over to you. I see you are smiling. <laughs> good. Uh, well, of course, you know I will smile. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> good evening. Good evening. <laughs> it really ties into the comment Prof made about the politicization of our culture. And it's quite interesting what you were saying about worry and the similar thing in Kano. Um, Emir Sanusi Lamido Sanusi and the happenings in Kano where it's the politicization of culture. And what happened with um, the current Ulu of worry, I would say it's also similar. It's also the same thing. So historically, that happened before. 
But because they didn't want him at the time to be the Olu of Wari, they found a reason for him that would disqualify him. And at least from my Shekiri friends, what they referred to was the fact that his father was a Christian. And what he was able to do while he was, I think, his 20 plus year reign, and that sort of um, restrictions on those who were more traditionalist in their thinking and in their approach, they were literally tired of someone who stopped them from doing that. And the way they could stop the current Olu of Wari from ascending the throne was to suddenly create this rule that, as you've said, didn't have any historical precedence because it had already happened before. But it did happen. They were able to push it through. His uncle became the Olu of Wari, unfortunately passed on, and then um, time, his, time has, his time, in a sense, has come. And the similar, and, I, and the beauty of it, which I think Prof also alluded to over the, that we saw, was that the diversity that Nigeria has in the richness of our culture, the richness of our language, that we don't allow it to flourish. We don't, we don't I mean, even just a, a easy common denominator of that across the country is our tourism sector. I grew up traveling from Yanga, Kari game, game reserve to different parts of the country, and I, and I lived in Ife. But now, not only just insecurity, before insecurity, those places are not maintained. The zoo at the University of Ife then had mm. lions and, I mean, it was a proper zoo. I mean, now, we, I don't know of any university in the country that has a zoo that can be called a, a proper zoo of a university or even of, of a country. I'm not even sure that we have a national zoo set. So the things that we have that we can, we can, that brings us together, that can bring us together, are things that we've also not invested in. So it's a, it's a pattern of the way that we see ourselves that's reflected in the way that we, that we use our culture to, to bridge divides. I like Prof's um, merging of Beachy and, and Wari and North, South and all of that. I mean, it's, I would say it's cute, but it really doesn't do anything for the fundamental issues that we continue to run away addressing. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Yemi Adamoleko. I think uh, we should take a break now. Here on this day live, the Sunday talk show. When we return, the conversation will continue. Don't go away, stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to this day live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News channel. Still with me, here in the studio, I have Professor Bola Kintenroa, Director General Bulitak Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies. Yemi Adamolekun, Executive Director in Office Enough, and Chike Ugea, former Commissioner for Information at Delta State. Well, I mean, we have two big topics, two additional big topics, the Petroleum Industry Act and also the uh, grazing reserves and the concern of the uh, host communities, as has been expressed by Senator Emmanuel uh, Ibo Kessian. Well, let me start with you. You are from the Niger Delta. What are your concerns in this regard? <laughs> Chike Ugea. Yeah, thank you. Um, very, very interesting topics, both of them. And um, like you rightly said, they are topics that um, touch and concern the Niger Delta. So looking at it from someone who comes from that part of the country, obviously it is easy for everybody to come here, you know, people that are not from that place, that don't have an idea of the enormity of the problems there. While not defending the leadership of the Niger Delta over the years, I have never been a governor. I have worked very closely with one, and I could see at the time I was working with him, his commitment to trying to make sure that whatever funds that were allocated to him were as evenly spread as he possibly could between the overall type of development you talk about, which is the one you want to see, building roads, building bridges, building general infrastructure, whether stadia, whether airport, you know, and all of that, to actually making a difference with the kind of pro poor um, initiatives you come up with for the people. And if you ask me, like one of the things the governor of Delta State did when I was there, like I said, was the kind of interventions he made in the healthcare system. 
where he got down to the poor of the poor to be able for women to have children without paying any kind of fees. Well, you see, those kind of policies are policies you can't quantify. And um, there are things that happen. It's only those people that can understand that. But my submission, basically what I'm saying, is that without holding brief for the leadership across board, I can assure you that those monies, whether 13% derivation, which the different states have the different vehicles that they use to try and get that to the people that they should get to, and what other else money they also get from you know, the federal government allocation, also from internally generated monies, for the Niger state, they don't even begin to scratch the surface. That is the truth of the matter. They don't even begin to scratch the surface. So when you give us a PIA now, which is giving us 3%, you know, I think that is the height of, um, of, of saying to us that um, we don't matter. That is the truth. It took 20 years to get that bill. Well, is it going to take another 20 years to amend it so that it can work for the people it, what it's supposed to work for? You know, those are the questions we are beginning to ask. Now, um, if we look quickly at the grazing situation, I think our governors have made that one clear. They have said, you know, the 17 of them are cross board in the south, of course, which includes the Niger Delta. In the case of Niger Delta, we don't even have land for that because half the land mass or three quarters the land mass is water anyway. So where are they going to graze? You know, I think we should, you know, be realistic in the things we do in Nigeria. You know, God has been gracious to us. We have different kinds of vegetation for different things. And I think it's just a matter of, you know, maximizing, you know, the benefits for the right things. And let's not get confused about all these things we do. Well, we have just about a minute to go, but uh, Professor Quintenroa, let's start with you on these two subjects. And then when we come back, you continue. Over to you. I think uh, Dr. Fawibe <coughs> raised one critical point that we should not um, neglect. He raised the issue of uh, indiscipline in the Niger Delta, which uh, the senator also corroborated by comparing, for instance, what obtains in the Aqua Ibom state and uh, in other states. He described other, other governors precisely as uh, irresponsible in this case. No, they were no, not he serious. Didn't that. He, didn't say that, Prof. But, he just but, mentioned River State and Aqua Ibom, and he has his uh, reasons for so doing. Yes, which is fine. He took us back no. to 1973, early days, where, for instance, 13 percent derivation. What was given to them? What has happened to that? You see, the beauty of this issue is that as much as um, your argument will be tenable, um, Shike, the issue now is what you are giving at a point in time. We couldn't see the, the, the outcome. So at the level of I mean, discipline in the Niger data, he said he didn't want to, he's not implying that people will be incited to go to their government. No, but I wish you ask. So even if you are giving three minutes, um, three percent, what will happen to it if that factor of indiscipline is not removed? Anyway, which was the point I was making about the quality of spending. Precisely. But let's take another short break here on This Day Live, this Sunday talk show. We'll be back shortly. Stay with us. Welcome back to This Day Live, this Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. Here with me, I have in the studio, Professor Bola Akintenwa, Director General of Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies. Yemi Adamolekun, Executive Director in Office Enough, and Chike Ogia, former Commissioner for Information uh, Data State. Before we went on break, uh, Professor Akintenwa, we were responding to the points made by uh, two guests uh, on the Petroleum Industry Act 2021 and also the Open Grazing uh, reserves now that uh, the presidency is talking about gazetting the ungazetted. Dr. Fawibe, first of all, um, raised the issue of uh, first subsidy. 
reply to your question that look, he believes that for as long as we do not have very functional refineries, it may be very difficult um, to talk about uh, removal of uh, subsidy. I, I share his uh, viewpoint on this. He also said that uh, we should differentiate between um, commercial operation and the regulatory bodies in this particular case. I, I will not also quarrel with that. He did say that there is no perfect law and that uh, there will be room for improvement of the act. I also share this view, but my question is this. For instance, when you still have the room to amend, to review, why should you wait until tomorrow? When the matter is being raised right now, why shouldn't it be addressed? Now the Niger Delta use, the host communities are already complaining. And we have just been told by Senator Ibok in this particular situation that where well, the people of Niger Delta are not feeling comfortable. So uh, I think that um, I will share the viewpoint of, um, or let me say, the disappointment expressed by um, Senator Ibok in this case that um, what our president is doing is not good enough. Not good enough because the critical problem in the Niger Delta is the issue of um, degradation of the environment. It is also the fact that sooner than later, there wouldn't be oil again, no crude oil. And now, if you don't have crude oil, what will become of the environment that is more than 50% uh, maritime in, in, in character? Then what will be the future of the people? So if the people now want to have more uh, funding in order to prepare for the challenges of tomorrow, I think we need to look at that. The mere fact that uh, um, we used to have 50% given to host communities uh, before the 1963 constitution, and the mere fact that 10% uh, was even proposed, called down to 5%, but further reduced to 3%, but only to give 30% for the frontier basins for exploratory purposes. Those who are already faced with the challenges, we are not addressing that. But the futuristic one that you want to do, you are locating money for that. No, this is not um, good enough. It's most unfair. And in this particular situation, I think the president is simply presenting himself um, in, in such a way that he's always favoring what um, is good for his people. And then when others complain about this, we are all his people. Are, no, we are, we are no, we are not all his people. <laughs> no, Prof, we are all Nigerians. That's different. He's leader of Nigeria. <laughs> we are all Nigerians. Please, President Muhammad Buhari told us that he appoints people he knows. I quote his words. That's right. So he only appoints the people he knows. It is also on record that President Muhammad Buhari said people who gave him 3% votes, 5% <laughs> votes, cannot be treated the same in the, the same way. Yeah. Please, I'm a research fellow. Yeah. My problem is to read and then refer to that. So I don't have all these things. So if President Muhammad Buhari can tell us that, how can you say I am his people? <laughs> I am a Nigerian. Yes, he is a Nigerian. <laughs> I am a Nigerian by the principle of Il Sanguinis and by the principle of Il Soli. I am a bona fide Nigerian by place of birth and by descent something. So in this case, and I'm talking in my capacity as a Nigerian. Well, point well made, Prof. Uh, you know, ethnic politics is always very delicate around here. Quickly, uh, Yemi Adam Alekun, your take on uh, open grazing reserves and also the uh, PIA, Petroleum Industry Act 2021. Thank you. I mean, I haven't read, I followed a bit of the advocacy around passing the bill. 
but haven't read the final act. But in terms of the comments that the two gentlemen have shared, I do agree. I think I definitely agree with Prof in the sense that it's not just about what happens in Abuja or happening in Abuja. The leaders of the Niger Delta uh, and uh, do have questions to answer. It was interesting that the senator mentioned Akwa Ibom specifically because, yeah, you can see what has happened there, but Akwa, Akwa Ibom is not the Niger Delta. So if he could only mention one state, yeah, he mentioned Rivers as well, but I mean, I, I've been to both states and I quite frankly don't see what's there in Rivers that I can say speaks to the amount of money that has come through the River State government over the last 20 years. So if we can only point to one state, or maybe one state and a half uh, out of the Niger Delta states, then that says a lot. And again, look, our conversations tie to this Nigeria question. Who is a Nigerian? What does it mean to be Nigerian? Um, as Aisha says, no Nigerian should be more, more Nigerian than any other Nigerian. So the inequality of being a Nigerian, which is why you complain that the, the source of the oil gets 3%. The pipe, the lands where the pipes go through get 3%. I, I don't think that part of it was removed or amended. And then in an environment in the 21st century where we're saying that we need to look beyond oil, I don't know the number of conferences that have happened in the Niger Delta, in Abuja, in Lagos, titled Nigeria Beyond Oil. We're allocating 30% of this money that's still being contested to look for more oil. I mean, that, if nothing else in the grand in this sort of grand conversation speaks to where we are and how we are forward thinking. That alone tells a lot. And the same with the grazing reserves, uh, 25 states. And as the senator said, I think, no, sorry. Yeah, I think it was the senator that said it. We're going backwards in the 21st century. Again, until we agree on who we are as Nigerians, what's important to us and what it means to be a Nigerian. And the, the, the issues of justice, of equity, Will continue to come up and we'll see it in insecurity and see it in bills like this that get passed. I mean, the bill was passed by the National Assembly. The National Assembly is not filled with Northerners. And I thought it was interesting that the Senator alluded quite, I mean, I don't think he was trying to shy away. He said if it was, if the source of the oil was the North, they, that not only would they request for 50%, they would get 50%. So it's really quite interesting, the, the dynamics of representation in Nigeria as well. Very good point. But what do you think of the position of the governors uh, that their views have not been taken on board and they've not been uh, represented? Should they go to court, as uh, Michael Zekomen, SEN, has recommended, to test Section 162 of the 1999 Constitution? You know, and I thank you very much for reminding me of that point. The organization that, that I lead over the last um, five years, or seven years, really, we've advocated that voting in the National Assembly should be public so that we'll know how every senator and how every, how every House of Rep member votes on critical bills. I consider the PIB a critical bill that we should have known how everybody voted on certain contentious issues. We saw it recently with the electoral amendment and we saw citizens taking up their senators who were not who were missing in action, who were missing from work on the day the votes were done or those who voted against ele um, electronic transmission of results being taken up by their constituents, that why would you do that? And then we could analyze the pattern to see that APC, who wants to stay in power in 2023, has, does not want electronic transmission of results. And then we saw the fact that colluding with the NCC, they got people from the NCC to say, oh, we don't have enough penetration to do electronic transmission. Meanwhile, INEC, who has set up a platform, who has tested the platform in at least 20 elections, if I'm not mistaken, is telling you, don't worry, we got this covered, we have the network, we can do it. NCC, the regulator, in cahoots with the National Assembly, are giving testimony that it's not possible. So the fact that the National Assembly continues to insist that it will not use, and mind you, they have the gadgets. It's not that they need to find it or spend money. The gadgets are right there. They just refuse to use it so we cannot hold them accountable. And I dare say, governors that are now shouting or shouting foul, are what, what where were you when your senator and house of rep member were voting did they vote in alliance and what did they say at that time so these things will always come back to hunt us as long as we choose the path of unaccountability we choose the path of playing politics with everything and then we expect the outcomes from a policy perspective to make sense it will never make sense 
So if we're not transparent in how we vote, if we're not transparent in how we're advocating, if we're not transparent in how we're um, lobbying for the constituents that we represent, then this is what we will get. Again, we come back to this. Until we're ready to define who we are as Nigerians, what we want, and how we want to move forward with the rest of the world, continue like this. Well, thank you, Yemi. Let's take our final topic of the day. Zambian opposition leader, Akainde Ichilema, secured a short landslide victory in the nation's presidential election. The Electoral Commission of Zambia chairman, Iso Chulu, announced Ichilema's victory over incumbent President Edgar Lungu at a briefing early on Monday in the capital, Lusaka. Ichilema obtained 2.81 million votes against 1.81 million for Lungu, the biggest margin of victory in a quarter century. We understand what you want us to do. We comprehend that. We are under no illusion. We know what you want. And we want to thank you at this stage for your support. And we pray that we will be worth of your trust will be worth of your confidence that you have demonstrated and placed on our shoulders to deliver. To deliver, to answer your cries for change. Fellow citizens, it is indeed a new day in Zambia. It's a new beginning for all of us. President Edgar Chagwadung. I want to thank you, sir, for your message, for conceding defeat, and for indicating that you support a smooth transition, I don't want to call it power, of servant leadership. Well, winner of the uh, presidential election in Zambia there, Akande Hichilema. His uh, inauguration, his swearing-in, will be on August 24, uh, that uh, on Tuesday. And countries are already naming delegations that will be there. Uh, but what lessons can we learn from the uh, Zambian experience? And uh, what is the future uh, for Zambia under the leadership of Ichilema? And uh, what does this say about the electoral process, democracy, and leadership? Uh, in Africa, considering the fact that uh, ahead of this election, President Edgar Lungu uh, promised uh, hell and uh, fire, and he deployed, uh, you know, uh, security agencies. He threatened to deal with uh, Ichilema if he won or if he lost, and now here we are. Uh, he has been faced with the reality, and he has had to uh, congratulate uh, Ichilema, who had struggled to be president of Zambia five times, and now is uh, lucky the sixth time. Uh, Professor Akinten, while this is right down your alley, uh, let me start with you. If, for instance, uh, he was promising fire, brimstone, lungu before, the situational reality on the ground does not allow for that. Zambian electoral system is a two-round um, system. You need to secure minimum of 50% uh, in order to be elected in the first round. And now he has 51.1%. Um, 50 50.1%. 50 okay, okay. Now, uh, in terms of um, number, he has 2.8 million votes. Now, um, Lungu, the incumbent, has... 1.81. 1. You have at least about 1 million votes. So it is not a marginal, it is not just a narrowly winning. So in this case, it is not possible for him um, to now want to create problem, etc. Second point, you rightly um, indicated that, look, he had contested uh, five times. And five times he failed. You are right. The issue now is that in the past, especially if you want to look at the 2015-2016 election, um, Ishelema, the president-elect, 
lost very narrowly. Very narrowly. But this one, this election, is, um, is, is so clear. So when you look at it, when you are talking about what lessons to learn, what's the future? We need to look at the factors that are responsible for his election. The first one is that, uh, you know, 54% of the registered voters are youth. And they are youth that are 34 years of age and less. So the youth are vehemently opposed to the, the type of um, agenda that President uh, Lungu wants to have. It is on record that Zambia is um, funding the foreign debt by 30 to 40 percent of uh, its income. Lungu is talking about infrastructural uh, investments. Whereas most of the uh, Zambians uh, do not even have food on table. So people are not interested uh, more on uh, the infrastructure you are talking about. Lungu is also avoiding any relationship with uh, IMF, all those things. Whereas we have um, the president-elect favoring all that. So in this case, these factors, we can learn from them for our own cases in the future. Well, quickly, Yemi, let me come to you. Uh, Zambia, the election, i would ask what lessons have we learned? I guess there's something to be said about the power of the people, which turned out over 70%, and also the integrity of the electoral commission that decided to insist on the electoral code and refused to be intimidated by the ruling party. Yeah, those two factors, and we've seen that in Nigeria, when people are ready and we come out to vote, and when INEC does its job, the outcomes work. People are happy with the outcomes, let me put it that way. I think one of the things from the last election, we've actually taken INEC to court on it, is the fact that polling unit level results have, nev have never been released. So you announce a president, but we, the citizens who voted for this thing, voted in that election cannot compare what you added up to get the votes to what happened in their own polling unit. Because part of the big advocacy for the 2019 elections was for citizens to take pictures of the final results and their polling unit. INEC was supposed to paste the final results. But so if we have all of that, till today, if I'm not mistaken, INEC has still not made public polling unit level results from the 2019 elections. So as you said, when the numbers and the process aligns, citizens usually get what they want. And it's a lesson for Nigeria. I mean, I'm quoting SBM Intelligence. This is only the 24th time in 304 elections since 1990 that an opposition uh, candidate has won. And in Zambia, it has happened three times. In Ghana also, I think Zambia and Ghana have the highest where it has happened three times. And it's uh, a reminder really for Nigeria that it is possible. For me, regardless of how horrible President Buhari's administration has been, uh, just really in, in, just in, incompetent on, on many levels, it for me was a sign that, it, yes, it's a personal opinion. Anybody, don't worry. This is not this day life's opinion, not a rice TV. It is Okoyemi Adamalekun's opinion. Come on, Karim. It's my opinion. But it's at no point one of the things that I think it's, it clearly states for anybody who, who, as wary as this season might be for Nigerians, is that it is possible for an opposition candidate to come into office. And I'll, I'll um, use Mr. Asienda's look, servant leadership, not into power, uh, as military would say. But it is possible. And that, for me, is what 2015 elections would always represent that when the Nigerian people decided they had had enough. Now, they didn't quite articulate what they wanted, so they went with the choice that was available. But what was clear in the decision was this man I had done, we were done. And the votes, the votes bore, that, bore that witness. 2019 is a different conversation entirely, but for 2015, that was very clear. And again, Nigeria, as we go into 2023, and other countries on the continent, or really around the world, when the people decide that they've had enough, that's, that's really it. Yeah. Enough is enough. Yeah. Good point. But, uh, you know, incoming uh, President uh, Akainde Ichilema has his job cut out for him. 
He has to turn around the economy. He has to worry about poverty. He has to renegotiate debt with uh, the IMF and also China, which is responsible for the bulk of the debt uh, owed by uh, Zambia. Uh, Chike, over to you. Well, <clears throat> I don't know if there's anything else to add, but I think the most important thing, I think the most important thing in all of this, and um, very heartwarming it is, is that an opposition you know, has won an election again somewhere in Africa. That, to me, is a critical lesson to be taken here. Um, like you rightly said, governance means a lot of things. It's not just about looking pretty and coming out there. Yes, all what you enumerated that he has to do, it goes with the territory, it comes with the office. I assume for a man who has wanted to be president five times, he better be ready for the challenges. Um, obviously, the Zambians, you know, are tired of whatever their old order was. Just like Yemi alluded, when the people are tired, they are tired and they make that change. But sometimes the change they go for, is it better than what they are changing? That becomes a different conversation. But the most important thing is that the people's voice have been listened to. And um, I pray that the new administration in Zambia, do not disappoint the people of Zambia. Very well said. Okay, on that note, let's bring you the latest from Afghanistan. The United States has drafted commercial planes to help out with the evacuation effort as thousands of people desperate to leave Afghanistan are continuing to crowd around Kabul airport a week after the Taliban seized control. NATO says at least 20 people have died in and around the airport in the last week amid chaotic scenes as thousands tried to flee the Taliban. Earlier, the British military said seven Afghans had died outside the airport. The situation there has been described as extremely challenging. Crowds have been trying to get through checkpoints in sweltering heat to reach evacuation flights. This, despite the U.S. warning its citizens to avoid the airport amid concerns about the potential for attacks by Afghanistan's branch of the Islamic State group. U.S. forces are currently controlling the international airport. They are helping to evacuate their own citizens and those of other countries, including Afghans who worked with Western forces and fear for their safety under the Taliban. But the U.S. has set a withdrawal date of 31st August for the troops, and it is unclear what will happen after this date. Yemi Adamalakun, do you have an idea what will happen after this date? Well, I mean, a big part of the conversation is where would Afghan refugees go? So at, at, until I think the U.S. and some of its, um, maybe the G7 countries have a clear plan of what they plan to do with Afghan refugees, I would bet that the date might become flexible. Well, uh, Chike? Well, the only surprising thing for me in all of this is that um, NATO did not react on time. Uh, I think um, everything was left solely to the Americans, who obviously bungled the withdrawal process. And that was why they had another Vietnam in their hands, if you ask me. And that was what left for this, in, um, this vacuum that saw that kind of confusion and death. Um, I think Europe, you know, not Atlantic Treaty Organization generally, I'm sure Prof will be able to help us with that. How come they didn't have, you know, a backup plan in place to have diffused the situation and um, taking people out. Maybe Prof should help Well, us. Prof, we have just one minute to close the program. Where the refugees will go, they will certainly go to uh, BBBD in uh, Uganda, which plays close to the highest number of uh, refugees the world over. The uh, United States has reached agreement with uh, the government of, um, of Spain they will also be going there. The issue is that all these people are expected actually to quickly check out. Why? Because the Masood have made it clear that they will never subscribe, they will never accept any Taliban rule, which means that the other encounter order amounting to disorder will always be there. So people must try to quickly escape, whether or not the Taliban government makes any pledge to be democratic, to respect women's rights.
Well, thank you, uh, Professor Akintanua. Thank you, uh, Chikyogia. And thank you, Yemi Adamalekon. You've been watching This Day Live, this Sunday talk show, here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abati. From my entire team here in Lagos, it's bye for now. And thank you very much for watching. We'll see you again next week. Thank you.